Uh, well, uh, taking an evening stroll uh, on a rooftop in Jerusalem could be a rather interesting experience. Uh, I spent, in the summer of 2001, three weeks there in Jerusalem. And one of our missionaries at the time, Rod Green, uh, happened to live like in the old city. Uh, and so one night he had us over for dinner, and, and at the end of the dinner he suggested that, that we go up onto the rooftop and just see the city. Now you have to understand, I, I grew up in Mustang, Oklahoma. That's a suburb of Oklahoma City. Uh, I'm used to, to living in a suburb. That's all I've ever really known my entire life. And so I'm used to having houses with yards uh, that were separated by fences, with trees, and just having plenty of room and space. In fact, uh, one day uh, when I was young, one of my friends, John Williams, not to be confused with the composer John Williams, uh, he dared me to climb up the tree that was kind of in between me and my neighbor's yard and to see if I could access my neighbor's roof uh, via the tree branch that hung over his house. Now, I can safely say to you this morning that I did accomplish that task. I would like to confess to you this morning that it was because of a youth, useful purpose, like getting a frisbee that had gotten stuck on the roof or a golf ball that, or a tennis ball that hadn't, we, don't, we didn't play with golf balls, I'm not that dangerous. Uh, or a tennis ball that, you know, had gotten stuck in the gutter. No, it just was to simply accomplish a, a dare and to meet a challenge. And so when, when I made my way up onto to the rooftop after dinner, I was immediately blown away by the sights and the sounds and the smell of a city that has been in existence for thousands of years. I mean, you can smell the, the brick and you know, the sand and you can smell all the merchants, and you can even smell the ancient history there in Jerusalem. I remember as we made our way up to the top, I looked out, and the first thing that met you was the Mount of Olives. And you just kind of, at least I did, I just kind of stared at the Mount of Olives for, for a few minutes, just kind of soaking it all in. And then as I started to make my way left and just kind of do a panoramic of the city, you could see the tower-like structure that was a part of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And if you don't know what that is, that's the traditional site of the death and burial of Christ, and you could see where that was at in the old city. So I'm taking this whole moment in, realizing that I may not get this opportunity ever again. I hope to. Well, as we're up there, and the team, it's just the four, five of us with Rod, and all of a sudden I could hear this commotion starting to, to happen off to my right, and so being the curious person that I was, I immediately started to come over here and try to figure out what is going on, and to my complete amazement, I could literally see, just like about five or six feet in front of me, a, a lady who was at her sink talking to her children, washing the vegetables as she was preparing for dinner. Now, again, you have to understand, I grew up in Mustang, Oklahoma, where our, our houses were separated by yards, and I... I I live now in a suburb, and i got to be honest with you, if I saw somebody staring at me from my kitchen window, I would be shocked, uh, mainly because we live in a walkout basement, and so our house, where the kitchen is, is about 15 feet up. That would be a giant. I would have other issues at that point. And so I'm up here on this roof, on the rooftop of Rod Green, and I'm staring at this lady Washing, watching her wash the dishes, and eventually she had that moment, that human perception, where I think she realized somebody else is staring at her. And so she looked, and she probably thought, that's an oddly attractive college student looking at me, looking at me as she's making dinner. And so I, I didn't want to make it awkward, right? And so I just kind of like turned away, but that moment brought to life that time when David took that afternoon stroll up on a rooftop. Of course, if you don't know the story, we find it in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And David takes an afternoon stroll up on the rooftop there in Jerusalem, and as he's going and making his way, or as he's out on the rooftop, he discovers that there's this attractive lady who is, who's bathing. He inquires as to who she is. He finds out that her name is Bathsheba. He goes and, and says to somebody, hey, I, I want you to bring her uh, back to my quarters here, right? And here's what's the kicker. 
he does all this after he, found, after he already found out that this was the wife of Uriah, a soldier who was serving in his army. Well, the rest of the story goes is that Bathsheba is pregnant. She informs David. Obviously, this sends David into a panic, a downward spiral. He tells some of his other uh, generals, lieutenants, Hey, I, I need you to go send Uriah to the hardest uh, battle and put him in the, in the toughest line. And in the moment when we're in the thick of battle, I want you to go ahead and pull everybody back so that it's just Uriah. Not one of David, David's prouder moments, right? And yet, this is what David does as he's strolling out onto the rooftop there in Jerusalem. Well, in response to this moment of indiscretion, the Lord sends the prophet Nathan to David. Nathan tells David a story about a rich man with a lot of sheep and flock. And then he said in the story that there was this one poor man who had one ewe lamb. And as the rest of the story goes, they wanted to make a dinner out of this lamb. The rich guy said, no, you're not going to use any of my large flock. Go ahead and take this poor guy's Lamb. And because the rich guy was more powerful than the poor, they take the poor man's one lamb, who was like family to them, and they make a meal out of it. Now, of course, this outraged David, right? And he said to the prophet Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity." Nathan, the prophet Nathan, has this incredible response. You are that man. Right? Not the kind of you're the man in a good way. No, the prophet Nathan is saying to David, you are that guy. You were the king of Israel. The Lord's made you king of Israel. He rescued you from Saul, given you lots of things, and would have given you even more if you would have asked. But David had done something that was evil in the sight of the Lord. Of course, this moment with the prophet Nathan, with prophet Nathan it broke David. It caused him to repent. And in response to that, he wrote this psalm. And I invite you to stand, those who are able with me this morning. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Have mercy on me, God, according to your faithful love. Wipe away my wrongdoings according to your great compassion. Wash me completely of my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Because I know my wrongdoings, my sin is always right in front of me. I've sinned against you, you alone. I've committed evil in your sight. That's why you are justified when you rendered your verdict completely correct, when you issued your judgment. Yes, I was born in guilt, my sin from the moment my mother conceived me. And yes, you want truth in the most hidden places. You teach me wisdom in the most secret space. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and celebration again. Let the bones you crushed rejoice once more. Hide your face from my sins. Wipe away all my guilty deeds. Create a clean heart for me, O God. Put a new and faithful spirit deep inside me. Please don't throw me out of your presence. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Return the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach wrongdoers your ways, and sinners will come back to you. Deliver me from violence, God, God of my salvation, so that my tongue can sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will proclaim your praise. You don't want sacrifices. If I gave an entirely burnt offering, you wouldn't be pleased. A broken spirit is my sacrifice, God. You won't despise a heart, God, that has been broken and crushed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
in response to that moment of indiscretion, David wrote this psalm. Psalm 51, it's a psalm of, it's a plea for forgiveness and renewal. David has been confronted directly with his own sinfulness. I don't know if you've ever done this, but taking a hard look at yourself in the mirror can be a very humbling experience. The first words that David wrote, in fact, I'm sure it's probably the first words that David said in response to this moment as he was confronted by the prophet Nathan was, have mercy on me, O God. We've since turned this words of David and adapted them into a prayer of penance. We, we say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. What is remarkable about this plea for forgiveness is that in this entire psalm, David doesn't quite specify what it is that's gotten him in trouble. We know the story. We know why he wrote this story. And it's just a litany of poor decisions and, and a sin on top of a sin. You see, the problem was it wasn't just Uriah's life that was lost. It was also the life of David and Bathsheba's first child. David doesn't mention what exactly landed him in this moment and why he wrote this psalm. You see, for David, he was convinced it wasn't just one particular sin. No, he says there, I've been sinful from birth. My whole self is sinful. That's the problem. But in this plea for forgiveness and renewal, David is asking the Father to do what only the Father can do. Create and me a clean heart, O God. And put a new and right spirit within me. You see, that word create, it's a verb. And, and in Scripture, it is always used in reference to what God can do. David is asking that the Father bring into existence that which is currently not within him. A clean and pure heart. A new and right spirit. You see, most of our prayers for help, they, they go something like this from time to time. Lord, Lord, change my situation. Lord, change my circumstances. Lord, change my spouse. Lord, change my children. Lord, change my job. What David is saying is that, Father, I need you to change me. Sometimes, the problem is not with somebody else. Sometimes the problem lies within us. I know I said this to you before, but I'm reading Lord of the Rings again, so a lot of things just come up to me with Lord of the Rings. But one, I, one of the things I love about Tolkien was that he was always quick to remind either Frodo or some other character that the problem is not always with Gollum or the pity that Bilbo had on Gollum. Sometimes the problem is within ourselves because if we were to be completely honest, evil resides within all of us. Scripture tells us that. Paul tells us in Romans that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This one moment of indiscretion for David wasn't just the only problem. David understood quite well that the real problem was that his entire self was sinful and has been that way since birth. But he's asking the Father to do what only the Father can do. Create. Put within me a clean and pure heart. A new and right spirit within me. That's the heart of this psalm. But then David goes on to say there in verse 17, here's what's required. A broken and contrite heart. That you will not despise. What the Lord requires is brokenness. What the Lord requires is a willing to be humble and to submit to a holy God. 
throughout Scripture, there are moments when we see brokenness displayed. One of my favorite stories about brokenness in Scripture is found in Luke. In fact, it's unique to Luke. And throughout history, many artists have done their very best to depict this scene in painted form. But I'm convinced that nobody has done it better than Rembrandt. This unique story that I'm talking about to Luke is the story of the prodigal son. Now, I have to be honest with you, I am not the best at art, judging art, what is good art, what is bad art. But there's something about this painting that has always captured my imagination. I was first introduced to it when I was in college, one of our humanities classes. If you don't know the story of the prodigal son, it goes a little something like this. This younger son of this father had requested that he receive his entire inheritance, something that would have been quite rude to do uh, even back then, as much as I'm sure it would have been today. And he goes and he squanders all of his inheritance, in making some very poor choices, doing some things that he shouldn't have done. He finds himself in a pig pen, eating the slop that the pigs would have eaten. At that point, he finally comes to his senses and he realizes that even my father, my father had hired hands. They have it better than I do. He begins to write his own apology. See, what I think Rembrandt does here in this painting is that he vividly depicts what brokenness looks like. When that young man would have left his father's house, he would have been well-dressed, well-fed. Probably would have been a very handsome fellow. But brokenness changes you. What we find here as he has returned to the father is a child whose head has now at least been shaven, if not most of the hair gone. His clothes are tattered. They're torn. They're caked in mud and probably animal feces. If you want to know what brokenness and humiliation looks like, look at the prodigal in this painting. And yet, that's not the last word. Because if you know the rest of the story, you discover a loving father who in this painting is embracing the returned son. But this loving father in Luke 15 was always out on the road looking for his son to return home. I wonder how many hours that loving father spent on the side of the road in anticipation and hope that his son would return home. And when he saw that his son was coming home from the distance, the father did the undignified thing and he went and ran out to the son. And before the son can even get out his rehearsed speech of being sorry, the father interrupts him because the father's too busy planning a party for his returned son. You see, the really good news is that God meets us in our brokenness and in our mess. He's not afraid to embrace us and love us because in the gospel story, redemption and life always get the last word. What I want you to understand this morning is that it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what embarrassing thing, guilty thing that you are feeling even now in this moment. What matters is that you understand that we serve a God who loves us in our brokenness and is willing to embrace us as we return to Him. I love this story in Luke 15 because I'm convinced it's not just the story of a prodigal son. It's ultimately the story of a loving father. God loves you. David committed adultery. David had Bathsheba's wife murdered. I'm sorry, Bathsheba's husband murdered. 
Moses murdered a man. Scripture is filled with broken people. The one thing that God will not turn away is a broken and contrite heart. David was willing to pray, Father, create in me a clean heart and put a new and right spirit within me. That's a dangerous prayer. It's a prayer from a broken person. Are we willing this morning to be as courageous as David? And to pray, Father, break me. I want to invite Josh and the praise band to come back up this morning. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. Listen, I've known many of you for almost three years. And I know this is not something that we as a congregation are always accustomed to doing. Because I'm afraid that some of us, we've been followers of Christ for so long that we've forgotten about our own brokenness. we become too prideful for our own good. We've become too stubborn and set in our ways to admit that even as we've walked with the Lord for so many years, there are still moments when we need to pray, Father, break me. Some of you this morning, you are the prodigal and you just need to return home. But you need to understand that there's a God who's out on the road who's waiting to embrace you because he doesn't care about your brokenness. He's not afraid to become undignified for you. And you might be surprised when you are embraced by the Father. Because what he ultimately wants to do is he wants to throw you a party and to say, welcome home, my returned child. I've waited on the road for you for so long. Come home. But maybe some of you this morning are like the older brother. You've forgotten how scandalous grace can be when it's given to somebody who you don't think deserves it. Christ died for all. And one day you're going to be surprised when you get into heaven who is there. It may shock you. But God never turns away the hungry. He never turns away the broken and contrite. So I want to invite you to come this morning. If the Father is speaking to you, we're going to sing this song one more time, Hungry. And if that is you this morning, if you're willing to pray that dangerous prayer, Father, break me. Create in me a clean and upright heart and put a new and right spirit within me. I assure you of this, only God can do that. No amount of self-help books on Amazon or Barnes & Nobles will be able to do that for you. No support group will be able to do that, although those are helpful. The creator God who spoke creation into existence is the only one who could put a new and right spirit within you. So as we sing this song, the altars are open. I invite you to be courageous this morning and come.